Coming up, Jane Trembath, one of the first female South African pilots. And then we talk to Vita Rigani, the largest carrot farmer in South Africa. The Mentorship Challenge with Mark Weiner. Hi, welcome to the Mentorship Challenge. I'm Mark Weiner, and mentorship is something I'm very passionate about. Throughout my career, I've been fortunate enough to have had mentors who've given me advice, guided me, and sometimes just acted as a sounding board. The purpose of this program is to connect as many people as possible with our mentors. All of our mentors are highly skilled people in their respective fields. Sometimes we think, I can't do this. Uh, I'll never be able to do that. I won't be selected. My special guest this evening is Jane Trimbath, who was one of the first of three pilots for SAA, who throughout her career has a number of firsts. She was the first lady pilot on Boeing 747-400s, I think 747-400s, Jane. And then the wide-bodied aircraft internationally, the first all-woman flight from Johannesburg to Port Elizabeth. Uh, and it goes on and on. But at the time, 1988, was it? I joined uh, Mailan in 1988. 1988, yes. as one of only three woman pilots. woman pilots. Now, you must have had huge challenges as a woman in what up until then was an all male world. Well, I was, I was lucky enough to have a job you know, with a smaller company beforehand. And when I applied to the airline, then everybody laughed. They said, they'll never take you because you're a woman. So when I went for my interview, when they did actually invite me for an interview, the, you know, the first time they turned me down just with a letter. The same, when I, they invited me for an interview after I had reapplied, then my interview was more than twice as long as the guys. <laughs> and I knew I had, to, I had to know the answer to every single question. Uh, but being in the airline itself, what was really tough for me was the unwritten rules because most of the male pilots who joined, they'd come through the Air Force and the, the unwritten rules came basically through the military. And I had nobody to guide me then in how to actually negotiate that. And that made it, it, made it difficult. I, I know very little about the, the airline industry, but I know when you've got men and they've got the three stripes and they're a captain, there's a big ego that goes with it. So if you're the pilot and your co-pilot is a man, that must have been quite an interesting uh, dynamic. You know, most of my co-pilots are actually just great people. I think in my airline, uh, the selection process that people go through to get into the airline, they actually select the best. So 99% of people are actually just great and they've got absolutely no issues with having a female captain. Um, you know, I went through, obviously, I spent many years in SAA, uh, in my airline, before I became a captain, because you have to build up experience as a co-pilot, a first officer. So I'd been around for a long time and I had experience by the time I became a captain. But it's just in the 1% that also I had to learn how to deal with as being a woman in charge. Your passion for flying started when your parents took you on the first a uh, light aircraft flight, and, and you fell in love with it. Yes, when I was, I was actually 16 at the time and going into matric, and I went in this light aircraft and it was just so exciting that I knew I had to be a pilot. Never wanted to do anything else? Not after that, no. Uh, do you think it's much easier today for women to, to, to become pilots? It is easier, yes. Uh, look, women wanting to become pilots face the same challenges as men in in most ways in that you have to figure out how am I going to pay for my flying or find a program, a cadet program to enter, which are, they're pretty scarce these days. So you have to find out how you're going to get your license. And then the next challenge comes just after you get your license, then you have to find out how you're going to get your first flying job. And now that's, that's really hard for men as well. But I think that those type of barriers, women and men face them equally. So on this, incredible journey. You must have had mentors along the way. Well, actually, I didn't. I've had to find out for myself a lot of the things and you know, do it by trial and error, and there were a lot more errors than, uh, than successes first off. 
that's why I'm actually quite keen on mentorship because I'm keen on passing on to the next generation sure, the all, the, yes, the experience all the things that, that I learned the hard way. Well, thank you, because I think that is so important when people, particularly people who've had to break down barriers, face challenges, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like the great trek mm. if, if we want to go back in South African history. You've got to jump the fences, go through the hoops, and you can make it so much easier for the, for the next lot to come in just by sharing those experiences. Uh, this is the way to do it, this is not the way to do it. Mm. Not that people always listen because unfortunately experience sometimes, particularly with the younger people, they, they tend to brush off. But those who do take it on board, it certainly makes their path and, and their life a lot easier. So if there was somebody out there today, a young girl, young woman, who wanted to enter the industry, what advice would you have for that person? Well, I'd tell them that they can follow their dreams, but there's going to be a lot of tough times along, along the way. There's going to be a lot of setbacks and that they have to develop the resilience to be able to get through the setbacks. And persevere. And persevere. And persevere. Yes, and, but learn from your mistakes. And that is something which also I can put across in mentorship is how to get through those tough times because I've been be through them myself. Because been through them. What else is there for you? Are you going to continue flying forever or is there something else that Jane wants to do? I, I'm very busy outside of the airline. I, I do a, a lot of volunteer work and I run a nature conservancy. I'm the chairperson of a nature conservancy looking after a beautiful bird sanctuary in Benoni. Uh, how would I guess it was birds? <laughs> they also fly. It's, no, I, I got into that accidentally. That it needed a leader and I stepped up. And that's something, it's, it's a completely different and something which I've not been trained for, but it's so fascinating that I've learned so much, but I've also been able to take all the lessons that I learned as a woman in a leadership position and apply them now in a different field of dealing with volunteers. So that's been quite fascinating for me, how I can take what I've learned and apply it in a completely different, different sphere. You know why we have this program? We want to connect as many people as we can with mentors. I also know that you have an extremely busy and tight schedule. You're still flying. Could I ask you, how many hours is it possible for you to give us to assist and help somebody who would like to enter this field? I can give two hours. Thank you very, very much. I do understand you're very, very busy. And is it possible for you to challenge anybody who could maybe double your two hours, a colleague, a friend, somebody else, not necessarily even in this industry, but somebody who you think would make a good mentor? Yes, I have someone I can challenge. Uh, another female pilot, but somebody who's quite unique in her qualifications. And can you give us her name? Her name is Wendy Santolano. Wendy Santolano, our production team is going to get her details from you and we're going to tell her that she has to certainly give us a few more than two hours. So we will give you credit for your two hours and whatever we get from her. Jane, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I can't begin to tell you how, how much admiration I have for what it is that you've achieved. People forget what it was like in 1988 and before mm. even when you were for the small airline. It's truly an amazing journey and I promise you if I do get on an aeroplane and I hear it's Captain Jane, I won't want to disembark. <laughs> I'd like to give you a copy of my book in appreciation for Hi. you uh, joining us. Thank you. And uh, really, once again, it's been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like to have the incredible opportunity of being mentored by Jane, please register online and apply for the mentorship. We'll see you after this break. Welcome back to the Mentorship Challenge. My special guest this evening, Vito Rugani. Vito, welcome and thank you for being here. I've really looked forward to this interview because you certainly have a wealth of experience and knowledge uh, in your particular field, which is, which is agriculture. Uh, for the viewers, Vito's family have been farming in South Africa since uh, 1887, is that correct? 89. 1889, and you're a fourth generation farmer. 
you did a BSc in agriculture, and then you worked on your family farm. For various reasons, that didn't work out for you, and you went out on your own, bought 20 hectares out Talton, Krugerstorp way, and decided this was, you were going to make your mark as a farmer. You then uh, went into partnership with somebody who had a farm close by, Vincent, and for the next three or four years, uh, to put it mildly, you struggled. Well, when we started off, you know, I often listen to people giving their frust- expressing their frustrations as being emerging farmers. Nobody takes you seriously. The banks don't even um, give you a chance to borrow money. And uh, it really is extremely difficult to start off. And that's what we were. We were emerging farmers. And our biggest problem was raising capital. We, we had a lot of ideas. Um, but uh, no money, you know, no, no money, no fun. You can't get on with anything. And you were, you were growing a range of, of vegetables or...? We were classic market gardeners. We, had, uh, we grew 25 different vegetables through the course of the year and we then would pick them by hand and uh, pack them and deliver them off in the local greengrocers and restaurants and what have you. So as a typical market gardener servicing his immediate area with fresh produce on a daily basis. And then you took a decision that really changed your life and you went to Australia. Yes, we we realized that we were going backwards. There was no ways that we could mobilize the capital required to invest into our business that would catapult it into becoming viable. Uh, We also had a huge problem in that we had very low wages, but very high wage bill. But that was the South African model. Exactly. South African farming was based on low wages. That was it. It was a paradigm. And uh, you you, you didn't mechanize because wages were cheap and uh, you didn't have to worry too much about productivity because wages were cheap. So you could devote your energy and your efforts to other areas. And uh, my, my partner sat down with me one day and had a very serious chat and he said, he's not prepared to carry on like this. He said, we work like dogs. We get up early in the morning, work all day, go to market at night, deliver to the shops. And at the end of the month, we've got nothing to show for it. And then you took a decision that really changed your life and you went to Australia. We went to Australia because uh, it, it, it is similar to us, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it also wasn't too far advanced. I think if you go to the United States, for example, the, the farms there are, are two generations ahead. But the Australians were just a bit ahead of us. And uh, we went there, they spoke English, they drove on the correct side of the road, not like everyone else. <laughs> and, well, uh, you, you, you say they speak English. I go to Australia <laughs> fairly often. I'm not quite sure that's the case. Okay, well, it's understandable. Okay, whatever uh, they understandable, speak. <laughs> okay. And uh, we, we, uh, we suddenly, when we got there, we were lucky that we were well, fortunate. Um, that we were exposed to some great mentors and one in particular was an Italian farmer and uh, his name was Rocco Lamatina and he was the biggest carrot farmer in the southern hemisphere. We were exposed to this man's philosophy of of farming, especially his attitude towards productivity, innovation, um, future planning and uh, we realized that there were things that we were doing that were so archaic, we were, they were 100 years beh- behind, especially how we thought, how we approached things. Um, we came from a country that was full of excuses, and um, we began to realize that those problems were problems that they had well, too. So uh, you went to Australia, we exposed to carrot farming, mm. come back to South Africa and say, throw out the 25 vegetables that we're growing, and we're now going to specialize and plant only carrots, which I would imagine was contrary to the thinking because- Totally, in fact, it, it, it's just to say we went there and came back and threw out the carrots. That's what our mentor told us, yeah, do that. And um, we didn't believe him. We came back and we reduced our lines to about five. And then we carried on bumbling along and eventually we invited him across. And he came across and he spent about two or three weeks and we traveled the country and he looked at the situation and he came back and he said, we've got to have a time for a serious meeting now. And we sat down around the table and he said, um, take the disc harrow tomorrow and go and disc in everything except for the carrots. I've told you, plant carrots. It's, it's a huge opportunity in this country. The level of sophistication is not there. You're going to be streets ahead. Do it. And only after that second visit did we finally get the courage to 
carry out his instruction. And from that day onwards, we never looked back because so, of his advice. Huh? So today you took the advice. How many years ago was that? We, we specialized in 2000. In 2000. So 16 or 17 years later, you are now the biggest carrot producer in South Africa. You produce 40% uh, of approximately of the total carrot consumption. And that amounts to something like 230 tons. Correct, I, I, Mark, I was yeah. trying to think now, right. can you try and just give me an idea, what does 230 tons of carrots look like? It's, it's about a, just over a million one kilo packets a week. A million one kilo yeah, packets a week. So what the housewife week. buys in the shop as a packet, a million of those a week. And, and I find it interesting because it's Greenway and, and you don't white label, you don't pack for any of the supermarket yeah. chains under their label, it's yours. I was exposed to Clem Sunter, one of his lecturers once, and he spoke about the, the inelastic commodity driven perishable market. And his advice was that you brand. In that environment, you brand. And uh, we took him very seriously. And we, we, we branded our product and we stuck to our guns. And I'd say that is probably the single most valuable bit of advice we ever received. But you also embraced technology because I understand that when, when you started, carrots had a very short shelf life and you had a technology which was able to extend substantially the shelf life and then able to widen the distribution. Oh, it's, 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 it was technology, well, it was pretty well accepted technology in the world, but in South Africa or Africa, it was unheard of. And basically it's, it's referred to life force capture. A carrot is a, is a, is a pantry of, of energy, of life, and it comes from Afghanistan naturally. So it's got these reserves to bridge extreme weather and temperature and whatever. And so a, a, a carrot is not like a fruit or anything. It's something that's got a lot of life force. And if you can get that carrot out of the ground and cool down to two degrees core temperature in the shortest possible time, it will trickle feed life force in you and get, you get a month out of your carrot in a fridge. We'll see you after this break. Welcome back to the Mentorship Challenge. So Vito, you have eight children, four in the business so far. That's right. Two at school, some, some others coming through. And two at university. Yeah. And two at university. So do you see this as a legacy? You, 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 more than a business, you, you see them coming in and their children coming in and this is really a, a Most long Most definitely, term. Mark. You know, farming is a, is a, is a, a multi-generational thing. Uh, it's very different to starting a company and build it up and sell it and then and, and retire. Farming is that the, the wheels turn a lot slower and um, there's a lot of institutional memory in forms of how to work with certain things. So it, it, it inevitably becomes a legacy. One of your sons said to you, we need to do something about the carrots that are broken or, or not right. And that led you into the carrot juice business. Mm -hmm. In 2011, my third son who is the the business manager, and he's got a financial accountancy degree, he, he, he said, you know, carrots, it's inevitable that you break 25 to 30% of your carrots, or they're too long, too short, crooked, cracked, discolored, whatever. And it, it, there's not much market value in a second grade carrot. So he said, we've got to do something about it. And um, um, I thought about it, we, we thought about it. There are a lot of things you could do, chop and freeze and do all sorts of things. We decided the best would be to go to, to juice. And uh, the first thing I did was made the statement and saying that we can go into juice, it's extremely capital intensive, but if we're gonna put up a factory, we can't put up a factory that's working like everybody else's factory or get a secondhand factory cheap. We've gotta go and get a factory that's 20 years ahead of its time. And, and that was our experience. You, when, if you're going into something, get ahead of the pack, get technology behind you, get innovation behind you, which means you've got to speak to people who know. You've got to I speak saw to that, you, that you consulted professors worldwide on the health, yes. the health properties of carrots. So, so you then established that uh, carrot juice has all these health properties, and you went back to Italy, and you found people who would manufacture specific revolutionary, in a sense, uh, kinds of machines that make carrot juice. Yeah, first of, in other first words, never been made before. So, uh, this is what we want, it's based on the latest thinking, and they did it. Yeah, yeah so it, it is a family business, and yeah. what I found very interesting is, you, you're the carrot guy, 
but you have a brother who you mentored. Yes. And he's the largest hydroponic lettuce farmer Correct. in the country. So, and also started from scratch. And started from scratch. <laughs> so we get lettuce from your brother, we get carrots from you, we, we can make the whole salad. And the from, carrot juice. And the carrot juice, <laughs> and the carrot juice, yes. So. Then you go further. We, we, we go from the carrot juice, where you're now producing carrot juice and you get what's left of the carrot. And now from a, uh, an eco point of view, you're actually using that to create methane gas mm. to power the, the plant, which yeah. I think is fantastic from a sustainability point of view. And then you take that one step further, and when that's done, you use it for fertilizer. That's right. That's, so there's that, no that's waste. Nothing, yeah. Tell me, aside from the, the first chapter in, in Australia, have you had other mentors in your life that have helped you along the way? Yes, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's sometimes we have a very um, warped idea of what a mentor looks like. Uh, a mentor, before you meet the mentor, what's got to be right is your heart. You've got to be teachable. You've got to Correct. understand there's a problem and believe that there is a solution. Because often we go through the whole process of being mentored, but we don't believe there's a solution. So we were already sunk our own ship before we even set sail. So if you could go back, say, 20 years, and what would be the one thing you would say you would like to teach yourself? Um, I think if your 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 first enemy is yourself you your 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 own mind when we when we're hurting we and when we're failing or when we are afraid of of the challenges we see before and I've, I've got a saying I always say and that is a man who fears his future will always turn around and look into his past to find an excuse somewhere there to justify tomorrow's failure and that's what we start doing. Oh, well, you know, the farming's like yeah. that. And, you know, I'm emerging farmer and all the excuses. They're just different excuses feeding the same mentality. Uh, I'm looking for my excuse to fail tomorrow. And the other thing, particularly in the South African context, which I think you've done that uh, you deserve huge accolades for. You have a workforce of about 250 people. Correct. You've given them a 10% share in the business. We gave it to them way back. Way back, way back started, before, yeah, yeah. You, when you started. Yeah. And now you're making land available for them to build houses. So it's not really the lives of 250 people that you're impacting, probably 1,500 with families. Yeah, the multipliers there, Yeah, yes. the multipliers. So that's really, really fantastic. And it's uh, unbelievable to see somebody who's South African, who has innovated to the extent that you have, been so successful, and yet brought your labor along. Oh, and also, as I understand it, you pay your labor something like 250 or 260% more than the recommended minimum wage in the agricultural sector. Basically, the, the whole driving force behind it is happy, disciplined staff that have a sense of ownership should perform better and uh, we had a problem in agriculture many years ago. It has changed somewhat now. The image of farming has improved, funnily enough. Um, farmers are not seeing as giving the worst jobs anymore. In fact, you can get a pretty good job on a farm now. So have a lot of your staff been with you for a long time from inception? Very much so. The, the situation is totally different today. Our turnover of staff is less than 1% per annum. And um, people put their name on a list to, to apply for a job when there's a vacancy. Now we get to the interesting part of the show, and I think you know why you're here. So what we are trying to do is to connect as many people as we can with people who can give them some of their time to mentor them and hopefully do for them what uh, your friend in Australia did for you. So can I ask you now, how many hours are you prepared to give our mentees? I'm prepared to give time to people, an uh, hour a week, easy. So if I said to you, can you give us uh, 30 hours? No problem. 30 hours, fantastic. Thank you for that generous contribution. Now something else for you. What we try and do is extend this. So do you have somebody that we can challenge, okay, that is associated with you, who could also act as a mentor? My partner, Vince, he's a uh He's a very good agriculturalist. He's actually the farmer. So thinking of young men who want to start farming, he's an excellent sounding okay. board Thank for, you for, for that. Thank you for that. So our production team will get hold of him. And hopefully 
for those of our viewers out there who have an interest in agriculture, I don't think we could find any better mentors than we have in Vincent and yourself. Pleasure, Mark. I'd like to give you a copy of my book to thank you for appearing. If you would like to have the incredible opportunity of being mentored by Vito, please register online and apply for the mentorship. See you next week. Thank you, Mark.